uh, first, let's look at um, polling and interrupt. Polling and inter interrupt are two different ways to uh, communicate uh, between the mi microprocessor and the device. Let's first look at what is polling. Polling is the way that you keep reading data from the device, from the microprocessor point of view. Um, you actually use instructions to read uh, the port continuously until you see a data. You can do something that you uh, plan to do. This way of getting data into the system is suitable for very high speed I.O. devices. Because in that case, you know that data are going to keep coming in continuously. So your microprocessor has to keep up with the speed of the data coming in. And it's suitable for the microprocessor to do polling. But when you deal with uh, slow devices, uh, or devices where you don't expect data to come in continuously, interrupt will make more sense. Otherwise, if you use polling in this device, uh, you're going to spend, actually waste a lot of CPU cycles just checking the port uh, continuously. So interrupt uh, is uh, asynchronous because you don't really know when the data arrives. Um, so you don't really know when the interrupt happens. You will know once it happens, but you don't have a prediction where uh, or when the interrupt is going to happen. Um, this type of interaction is for so-called need-based service uh, because some of the devices or data that you don't expect them to come in continuously, but once they come in at a certain uh, time in the future, you want the microprocessor to um, handle them. And this interrupt uh, way to deal with data transfer is more suitable for slow speed I.O. devices. For example, uh, your user application needs to sound an alarm if the sensor reading is between 5 and 10 units. So in your case, let's say uh, if the PIG sensor uh, detect the light intensity, uh, once it finishes the ADC, it knows the ADC value is um, probably between uh, 50 and uh, 200. Now, you may have a requirement that you want to trigger some action when the value falls between 100 and 120. Uh, but you don't know when that's going to happen. And this ADC uh, operation is relatively slow compared to the microprocessor or microcontroller. So in this case, uh, the interrupt is more suitable. In fact, one of the operations your device driver should support is what we call the uh, in-between action. Uh, in that case, uh, from the computer side, from the embedded system side, you want to uh, specify upper bounds and lower bounds. And once you notify the PIC about these bounds, uh, the PIC will uh, try to do some kind of filtering, it will generate an interrupt if the ADC value is indeed between these two bonds. That's what we call the in-between action. So in this case, it's suitable to use interrupt because you do not want the uh, embedded computer or the atom processor to keep checking the value. Uh, instead, this microprocessor can do something more useful. We explained how interrupt are uh, handled by microprocessors. We know in the microprocessor, interrupt will be handled by these interrupt service routine or interrupt handler. These are essentially programs, instructions that the microprocessor needs to execute uh, when an interrupt indeed happens. Some work needs to be done uh, when the interrupt from the device happens. And the amount of work depends on the actual device. You may have uh, more or less, uh, depending on how much data uh, it come, uh, the device receives, or what, what kind of processing uh, the microprocessor needs to do. There are some restrictions on interrupt service routines. For example, um, it's not executed in the context of a process. 
Uh, this is more related to the OS operating system terminologies. You know OS uh, can support multiple processes or multiple threads. And these are, uh, we say, user space threads or processes. OS has its own kernel, which is, this, again, um, a bunch of code. And OS kernel actually um, organizes itself also as threads, but we don't really um, talk about these threads or these contexts. Um, interrupt service routine is not executed as a user space application or as a, or as a part of user space uh, threads. Interrupt service routine are part of the operating system. And you should not let the microprocessor sleep uh, in this interrupt service routines. You can have whatever code that you want to have in an interrupt service routine that you design. However, one thing is uh, you should not uh, call some kernel APIs, for example, wait events, uh, locking semaphore or scheduler, because these operations may cause the um, OS itself to go to sleep. And you do not want to do that. It's okay to let a user process, user thread, go to sleep, but it's not a good idea to let the OS go to sleep. The interrupt service routine is to give feedback to the device about interrupt reception. So th this is typically, typically done by clearing the interrupt flag. For specific devices, you may have other registers you want to clear. Also, as a part of the interrupt service routine, uh, read write of data typically happens here. And also, it will clear up interrupt a bit. Um, the other thing it will do uh, often the time is to waken up processes which are sleeping on the device while waiting for some events. This is actually what we're going to do in our third lab. Some of the user processes may become uh, may go into sleep mode when their request cannot be satisfied. And we did that intentionally and either by user application or by the OS. But after these processes go to sleep for some time, and if they are waiting for certain events, and this event, uh, i.e. the interrupt happens, we need to wake them up. And this is done uh, inside an interrupt service routine or interrupt handler. Uh, this will depends on the mechanism the user application uses to go to sleep. The way to wake them up is different. There are different options. But the idea is in the interrupt service routine or interrupt handler, you want to wake up any processes that have been put into sleep due to waiting for this event. So here comes the way to do the I.O. operations for user applications. Blocking I.O. versus non-blocking I.O. If a user application requests something from a device, typically the way to request is by calling some system calls. So first you can open the device file, and then you can do a read. So that read system call will eventually be uh, trapped into a kernel, and the kernel will be able to locate the read function of the device driver code. Now for this read operation, if you do have data available in a device, or the device driver has something in its buffer, then we should supply these data back to the user application. And we do that typically by using copy to user um, system um, API within the kernel. However, there are cases data are not available. In this case, uh, you can either let the call return immediately, and the user application will, um, for example, uh, get a return code minus one to indicate this read operation failed. Um, but the other option is to block this I.O., to block this read operation. So what we're saying here is, if a user application wants to read data from the device, and if the data there's no data, then we can block this I.O. 
we can put this user process or thread into sleep. Similarly, when we do a write operation, if there's no available buffer or the device, the physical device is too busy to handle this write request, then we can also let the user uh, process to go to sleep. The calling process or the user space uh, application does not care about such issues. Uh, they only need to know read or write uh, operation. They only need to know the file handler of the special file. Programmers simply call read and write in their program and will, they will have their call return after necessary work is done. However, if we do, do want to support this uh, blocking I.O., we need to have the device driver to handle this. We want the device driver to block the process. That is to say, we want to put the calling user application to sleep until the request can be uh, served or can proceed. Here is a simple illustration of what will happen when we make these system calls from a user application. In this example, I have my user application here in this blue box. And the first thing I want to do is open the special device file. And assume that we have the proper major number and minor number when we create this uh, special device file. And because of this major number and minor number pair, the kernel will be able to identify this special file, essentially link this file to the my driver, the kernel module that you inserted uh, before you run this user application. So later system calls, for example, this read, will use this file handler, which is returned by this open system call. And this file handler will be able to link the subsequent system calls to the same driver. So in this case, we perform a read file add handler, comma, buffer, comma, size. So we're trying to read a certain number of bytes from that file, and this is the user space buffer we supplied with the system call. When you design this driver code, you will have this file operation structure. And one of the elements here is the dot open equals device underscore open. That points to the open function. And this read points to the device read function. So when this read API is called in the user application, the OS kernel will be able to trap that system call and point the execution to this function. Here you should do um, the things related to the uh, fulfill the read request. You probably want to check the buffer size, um, the data available in the uh, kernel buffer for the device. Also, you want to check the size that requested from the user application. If everything's all right, that means if you have data available in the device and the buffer size is okay, you want to do copy to user um, uh, API in the kernel so that the data on the device can be returned to the user space in this buffer. But some other cases, for example, if you do not have data available and you decide to block this I.O., then you will need to do something here to put the caller, that user application, into sleep. So what does it mean for a process to sleep? You know from your OS class uh, that the operating system manages the, all the processes threads uh, using its internal scheduler. There are different queues to uh, put them in. Uh, and these queues, the, each processes have different uh, states. They can be running, they can be sleeping. 
and the kernel keeps its internal structure, the queues, to uh, maintain these uh, states of these processes. We put a process to sleep. That means we're going to remove it from the scheduler's run queue. Run queue are the um, places to store the pointers to the processes that can be run uh, at next available uh, time slot. When we put a process to sleep, these process will not run until some future events happens. There are some rules about sleeping. When we try to put a process to sleep, we should be aware that we should never sleep within an atomic context. For example, if you're holding a lock, okay, um, locks are exclusive. So if you're holding a lock, that means somebody else cannot acquire the lock. And if you're holding a lock and go to sleep, that means this lock will be never released. If there's another process that's waiting for this lock, then they cannot get it. And you cannot dis sleep within disabled interrupts because you do want the OS kernel to be able to handle interrupts uh, at near future, in the near future. And for these processes to run next time, we cannot assume the state of the system after waking them up. For example, the request they uh, want to have may not be available at that time when they wake up. And also, we should make sure some other process can wake up. I mentioned earlier that there are many ways to put a process to sleep. And here we're introducing one of them. This is so-called wait queue. Wait queue is a kernel structure. This is a, a specific to Linux. This is a list of processes all waiting for a specific event. With this wait queue structure, the kernel can find these sleeping processes if they decide to wake them up in the near future. So this wait queue is a structure that the kernel maintains. But your device driver can utilize uh, these structures. You can actually uh, create a wait queue for your specific device and use it for your own purpose. This wait queue is managed by wait queue head. This is a structure defined in uh, wait.h, this header file. The way to use this uh, wait queue head is to declare at the beginning. Uh, the way to do that is to uh, just use this macro, declare wait queue head, and supply it with the name of the wait queue head. Or you can dynamically initialize using init wait queue head um, API in a kernel. So once you do this, you will have a wait queue hat, which can later be, be, be used to put process into and also wake the process up from. Next, I want to introduce um, a system call. Depending on the uh, flavor or the release of the Linux or US uh, Unix kernel, you may have different names, select or pull. In BSD flavor, it's uh, named as select. In Linux, it's called a pull. Uh, but I want to first uh, make you aware that this pull is different from the polling that we talked about at the beginning. Okay. Polling that we talked about at the beginning is a way that microprocessor will keep checking uh, the status of the device. Uh, it will spend uh, CPU cycles on doing that. But here, this poll is a system call, and we'll know uh, shortly what this system call is going to do. 
This system call allows user space applications to wait for data to arrive on one or more file descriptors. So user space applications can call this call um, system call to let the OS know that, hey, I'm going to wait on events of this particular file and this particular event. And also, a user application can do this whole operation on many files altogether at the same time. This is pretty, pretty much very useful on cases where uh, your task is to checking the status of different uh, devices, but you do not want to do this, keep checking this type of uh, operation, you want to let this process sleep, but the OS is charged to wake the process up if one or more events that the process is waiting for uh, indeed happens. Inside the kernel, uh, this system call will be eventually directed to the um, pull method within the file operation structure. And each uh, pull method should return whether data is available or not. If there's no file descriptors, uh, if there's no data available, then the pull or select call has to wait for data on those file descriptors. And in our example code that we provided, uh, we actually have a, uh, showed you how to use this uh, system call and how to implement it in the Linux uh, device driver. And that's where we use the wait queues to put a uh, process to sleep. Before we look at our example code, let's look at this um, short example here. Again, I'm using the special device, my device as an example, and this is mapped to the kernel my driver uh, module. You can see here in this file operation structure, the file pointer of pull as a, is the um, function device underscore pull. This is again the user application, user space process. After it opens the file, and it has to first prepare the whole structure, which we'll see in our example code. So this my pull file ID is actually a structure. This structure um, is populated with the file handler you're waiting for, and also the events you're waiting for. Once you populate this structure, you will then call this system call pull. You can supply a timeout to indicate uh, whether you indeed want this uh, pull to timeout. So when the user process calls this, it will eventually be trapped to the kernel, and the kernel find out that this is a pull system call. So it will go to this device pull function that you implemented as a part of your driver. Now, here we have this pull wait. This is a kernel API. Okay. Do not attempt to use it, this in a user space application. This is a kernel API. This is the file handler, actually the file structure that passed into this kernel. And this is the wait queue. Okay. <coughs> This is the wait queue that you're supposed to initialize uh, sometime earlier in your kernel code. So that means when this device, sorry, when this user application calls this poll function, the kernel will trap to this device poll and it will call this poll wait. This poll wait will put this user space <coughs> application, this application, to sleep. Specifically, this user process will be put into this wait queue, this RQWQ, this wait queue structure. 
is used to store this um, the um, record of this user space process. Yes. W is a mask that you supply. I will look at the sample code. So this is where we put the calling process to sleep. And we know that we will need to wake this process up sometime later. Depends on your actual device. But typically, what we do is we will do that in an interrupt service routine to wake up any sleeping process that are waiting for this event in this device. So the yellow block highlights the interrupt service routine code, which you will see in our uh, example. But here you can see that there is one thing this interrupt service routine will need to do, which is to wake up. And we're going to use the same wake queue the same structure. So that means when interrupt happens, okay, because we register this function as our interrupt service routine, so this function will be called. And when this function will be called, then this wake up will actually correspond to that whole wait. This wake up will really wake up the processes that are waiting for uh, the event. So this process will resume execution. What we didn't show in this slide is that this process actually was put into sleep for a certain amount of time. Um, here's another example. Uh, I will not spend so much time, but this is where we have a poll function in the kernel module, and we check actually both read and write, and we put the uh, calling process into both read queue and write queue. So next, we're going to look at the example code we provided. This is the um, repository from the GitHub. Uh, as a reminder, you want to do a git pull so that you can have the updated files. The new file I added is this readme.0 port, uh, which I will explain um, after we review the source code. So let's look at this pdpadc.c. This is the power port sensor device driver skeleton code. We looked at the we looked at the file operation functions that we define here. Uh, we have this open, read, write, and we have a pull function. You can change the names of these. For example, hook open can be renamed as long as you have the proper uh, function implemented in this module. So let's look at. <coughs> oh. D 
Did we talk about read and write last time? No? Or you don't remember? Okay. Um, maybe we, we can go start from here. So this is the open. So the, this hook <coughs> open function will be called when the user process calls open on that um, special device file. Um, it will search to see if the device has been opened before and then it will get its private data which has a lot of information specifically to the file you opened. In our case we have the um, necessary information for accessing the parallel port. And then you want to claim the port. This is uh, specific to the parallel port implementation of our uh, interface. If you're using serial port, this does not apply because uh, this is particular uh, necessary for parallel port. It will uh, mark this port has been claimed and then it will communicate with the device. This command pane is going to be um, talking to the PIC sensor. If you have the parallel port implementation in the command pane what you need to do is actually send the ping message and you expect the PIC sensor to respond with acknowledgement. And if you receive a, a res respond, response from the PIC, that means your PIC is operational. Um, so you will return zero. That's an indication of this open operation is successful. Otherwise, you're going to release the parallel port and just return uh, with a no device to let the caller know that this open call failed because um, your device is not functional. By device, we really mean the PIC-based sensor that you design. Any questions about this open function? No. Okay. So let's next look at So this read this hook read is going to be uh, called by the kernel when the user process calls the read system call on that particular handler uh, open and returns. The arguments that this read function takes is this structure file. This is provided by kernel and this buffer and the size. And an offset. Okay. The kernel will provide these parameters when it enters this function. What we our interest to do here is get the value from the sensor. In your second lab, you already implement this. In your parallel port based implementation, you implement that our uh, customized bus protocol. You send the msg get command, you get the ADC value plus the RTC value back. 
So you already have this in function implemented. Now, in the third lab, your task is to port that part of the implementation into this kernel space. So what's going to happen really is here, between this line and this line, right here, you're going to perform the read or the, the get operation um, so that the computer can get the ADC value and RTC value from the PIC sensor. Now, you can quickly review what you did there. You probably use the strobe signals, right? Um, you do the handshaking on both sides, and then you get uh, uh, bytes either 4 bit at a time or 8 bit at a time. In, after that, you want to put all the values in this buffer here. This is a buffer uh, inside the kernel. Okay, it declares a character kbuff, just basically a, a array of uh, bytes. You can change the size to fit your needs. And then before you do this copy to user, we assume that you already have the data, including the ADC value and RTC value, ready in this buffer. This is the kernel buffer. So the next thing we want to do is we want to copy the data from this kernel buffer to this buffer. This is actually the buffer of the user that you supply in your read call from the user space application. Good question? Uh, I will talk about that in the later uh, notes. That actually, you, you can use MBNLB uh, in the kernel space. Yeah, so here you're going to use MBNLB to manipulate the parallel port to do this um, bus protocol, do the handshaking, and get the bytes in. So that's exactly what you did in the second lab. So you essentially you port that part into this kernel space. So mark this line. This is where you're going to add your own code. This is actually uh, line 585. So this write operation is very similar to the read. Uh, it has this parameters, the file structure, the buffer. This is the user space buffer, which has the uh, information, i.e. the commands you want to write to the device, and also the size and uh, the offset. So we're doing the opposite of the read. Okay. So we will first do this copy from user. Because for the write operation, the data flow is from the user space down to the kernel space. And before you call the write in your user application, you should already have the commands or the data whatever you want to write to the device stored in the buffer, in the user space buffer. That is this one. And then we use this copy from user so that we can have that information, all the commands, stored in this kbuff. So after this copy from user, you will have all the commands, or whatever commands you, you call um, stored in this kbuff. Now, the rest of things will be like this. 
So you want to check whether the command is a valid command or not. Right? We support uh, the um, a list of commands uh, that we mentioned at the beginning. Uh, for example, reset, ping, um, set in between, uh, get. So these are the commands we uh, should support. So here you want to check whether the bytes we received are really a valid command. And if it is a valid command, then what is it? And then after that, you want to branch out to uh, the actual implementation of the command. For example, if a user application say uh, put get in that buffer, and then it calls write, so this get, these three letters, three bytes, will be passed down to this hook write. By doing this copy from user, this kbuff will now contain get, the get command. And because it's a get, it's a get command, your code should be getting the data. Right? So the subsequent uh, implementation of your code will be perform that in BNLB to really uh, execute this command on the uh, parallel port bus. Any questions? Yes. Um, I think we didn't really have a strict requirement on that. Uh, I will show you the scripts that we use well, in, as a part of the repository. Uh, those scripts are using um, human readable commands like GET and IESCT. Uh, but you, you, you do have the option that you use um, encoded the commands. It's essentially another um, step of translating uh, these um, human readable commands to your byte encoded commands. So next um, function we look at here is the pull function. This is a function will be called when the user space process calls pull. Here, the most significant thing is this pull wait. This pull wait is a kernel API that takes this file structure, also takes the wait queue this IRQ WQ is actually a wait queue that we internalized uh, when we open the device. And this wait is the pull table uh, of the uh, user process. So once the kernel gets to here, it will put the caller, the caller process onto this wait queue. But keep in mind here, at this point, we're talking about the kernel. The kernel is executing this line. What it does is to put the user process into this wait queue, and then it'll proceed to this return. The kernel does not stop. It's the user process that goes into sleep. So the kernel will proceed, and it will do uh, whatever it needs to do. Now, let's see. This is the interrupt service routine we register when we um, create, when we, when we 
allocate a hello port um, device structure. If you remember, let me show you where we did that. So this this is where we use that function. We try to create and register this parallel port device. And we provide this function as the interrupt service routine of the parallel port interrupt. This is why when you assert the interrupt pin on your parallel port, it will eventually, the kernel will eventually get to this PBADC RQ function. This is why. And in this function, we increment this counter to just record the number of interrupts. And then, more importantly, we do this wake up. Remember, this is the wake queue. We put the process into sleep. And this is where we wake it up. And this is inside the interrupt service routine. All right, so let me jump out of this skeleton code. This is the uh, lab3 directory. And if we go into script, we'll see some commands, some script. Let's do this one. So this is a shell script, and it has only three lines here. The first line, this is the indication of that this is a shell script, and this dot device is actually um, a way to execute another script in this current shell. It actually implement this. It, sorry, it execute this command. It will put the name of the device into this symbol and later when we get back to here we actually we print this we echo this four letter command to this file so this is the same as we are saying echo pain to this. This has the same effect. Even though this is a command line, a single line, it actually has a lot of things. It actually opens the device. Also, it writes these four bytes to this special file. So from the kernel perspective, it calls the open function, hook open. It then calls hook write. Remember, in hook write function, we're actually going to do a copy from user. So this PING, these four letters, will be passed into the K buff of that function. So when you implement your hook write function, you're going to parse these letters. If you chose to use this human readable commands, then you can figure out this is a pain command. And what do you do next? You just do the MBLB, do the pain uh, commands like you did in the second lab. And after that, you return zero, indicate this um, completes successfully. And of course, after this whole command finishes, it does a close um, implicitly. Implicitly. Uh, you are right. It checks that the loudness, uh, but only checks once. You do open. Uh, with this ping command, actually, if you have 
a user application or C program, you can do this ping multiple times. Um, but you're right that first open indeed does a ping. So similarly, you have other uh, commands. For example, enable. Um, get it's highly recommended that you use these scripts to test your program um, because I instruct the TA to use these to test but if you choose to use your other byte encoded commands you can do that, you just need to explain to the TA what you did. Um, that's also fine. Yeah. Can you say it louder? Uh, which function? Eval? CMD underscore eval is a function that you can choose to use. That's where uh, we do the parsing of these commands. So you can check if it is a PING, then this is a ping, if it's a GET, it's a GET, etc. So that's where uh, you can put your code to check the actual command, to parse the actual command. So we have to parse it. You can change the code uh, as you like. Uh, the TA will use these scripts to test your program and you can use your, these scripts to test uh, when you design these um, modules. If you choose to use other uh, command formatting, uh, it's fine, but um, you have to explain what you did. So it's easier that we all use um, this um, test script. So that means, you, yes, you need to implement a command eval function in the kernel code. Um, the next thing I want to explain is the user code where we call this poll. Okay. So we will do an open on the special device and then we will uh, set the timeout if you choose to have one and we populate this my poll FD structure this is a poll FD structure required when you call this poll in your user application so the effect of doing this after the user space application calls this poll the kernel will trap that call and then it will find out hook call that function that you implement in a in a uh, kernel module. It will put this caller process to sleep. Okay. And also you can set a timeout. If no interrupt happens before the timeout the return value will be a zero. So that's why here you're going to see no interrupt. If there is a timeout, I'm sorry, if there is an interrupt happens before the timeout, then this result, this return value will be a non-zero, so you'll see this interrupt. So this is how we're going to check uh, whether your pull function uh, handles interrupt correctly. And together with this pull.c, we have a between. Okay. This is to say, by using this command, this is to tell the device that we're going to use this first value as my lower bound and the upper level, upper the second value as the upper bound. 
So when the device, the pick gets these two values, it will keep checking internally, internal to the pick. If the value is indeed falling between this upper bound and lower bound, it will generate an interrupt. Okay, um, and we're going to stop here. Let's take a break.